Thanks very much, Carolyn, for organizing this whole thing. It's uh, a lot of fun. When this was offered to me, I pointed out that I'm a writer, not a reader, so please bear with me. <laughs> the more observant among you might notice that I've come in from uh, one of my more passionate activities. I'm passionate about riding and I'm passionate about motorcycling. And that is a bit of background information, the story that I'm going to read today. Uh, a few years ago, I got hired by a communications company as uh, some kind of senior position. And it was beautiful weather the first week I was there, so I decided that I'd commute in, right? So I came in dressed pretty much as I am today. But I wasn't sure if that was really appropriate for a senior manager of a communications company to do that. So I used to come in early in my bike gear, change into my work clothes, my shirt, my tie, my doctors, my concerts, in the washroom. And then I'd attend work at the end of the day, I'd reverse the process and go home. And this was fine for about three days. And I came out of the washroom after changing my bike gear one evening and ran nose to nose into one of the senior partners in the company. Uh, not nose to nose, because he was only, his nose was about here. And uh, he stepped back and he looked me up and down and uh, took a deep breath and said, Do you ride a motorcycle? And I said, Well, yeah, I do. He said, oh, thank God, I thought we hired one of the village people. <laughs> <laughs> but as I said, all that's background to me, like the story that I'm not going to read today. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've been shortlisted twice for the, the uh, National Literary Awards, and I've won Al Alberta Anthology a couple of times. And the first time I was shortlisted um, and didn't win, I was so annoyed that I took the, short, the, the story home, shortened it up quite a bit and then uh, submitted it to Albert Anthology where it was chosen. The, uh, the second one that was shortlisted was a story about um, a Volkswagen mechanic. And uh, I didn't realize until I got up here that I have this kind of transportation theme going. Because <laughs> I wanted to submit a motorcycle story. I thought I had a great motorcycle story. So at the last minute, I second-guessed myself, same as I did when uh, I worked for the communications company. And I didn't submit the motorcycle story because I thought that wasn't really appropriate for national literary awards. And uh, that year, you may remember, it was won by um, Ted Bishop out of Edmonton with a motorcycle story. <laughs> uh, so actually, the motorcycle story did get published. It's in an anthology called Reinventure, How to Reinvent Yourself Through Adventure Travel. This is chapter four of a book that's never been written. <laughs> it's called Dying Sunset. Beyond my reflection in the dust street bus window, a technicolor Baja sunset was assembling itself on the blue haze horizon. An hour or two behind us, in that swirl of gritty Mexican road dust that follows buses, was the latest in a series of indistinguishable small towns, all named after saints and manufactured from top to bottom out of dirt. In that town, like all the others, this bus deposited or picked up mail, packages, chickens, Mexicans, and the occasional backpack-lugging traveler like me. I twisted slightly in the sticky woven vinyl seat, trying to work the kinks out of my back without manufacturing new ones in my neck. I slid the canvas bag off my lap under the dusty floor between my feet. The Mexican man beside me snorted and twitched in his sleep. Despite the lack of creature comforts, I'd chosen the seat in front of the bus on purpose. The Mexicans prefer the seats in the back because most of the collisions are head on. As the autobus, as the Mexicans call them, shook and swayed down the highway south, I had a front row seat to watch sunset in the desert. All I had to do now was wait for the show to begin. But the highway hum, the heavy Mexican food, the comforting Mexican beer, the throb of diesel, the lack of air and the rocking caused by the semi-retired shock absorbers had a different plan for me. They conspired and I nodded off. I was dreaming of clouds and artichokes when I became aware that the noise level in the bus, the tire hum, the diesel engine whine and throb were dropping in pitch and in frequency. The nearly antique used to be a greyhound was definitely slowing down. I looked out the front window of the bus and there was nothing to indicate another dirt town in our immediate future. Outside, past the white puddle made by the three working headlights, a black strip of pavement vaguely vanished south toward the silhouette of some low hills. To 
To my right, the last pink ribbon of sunset embroidered the horizon, occasionally blocked here and there by cactus shapes. The rocking slowed and the noise level continued to drop until the engine was drowned out by the grind of tires hitting the gravel at the edge of the highway. A few seconds after that, we were stopped. Somewhere outside, I heard the relieved hiss of air brakes, and after that, nothing. No sound, no light, no town, no gas station, no buildings, not even a highway checkpoint like that one up north where soldiers with assault rifles, probably AK-47s, requested a donation to the Red Cross like they'd ever see it. I looked to the driver who sat motionless, staring straight ahead at the south horizon. Quiet settled everywhere like the dust. After the longest and stillest minute, I became aware of moving around noises in the back of the bus. As I was about to turn to look back, the driver flipped on an overhead light that bathed his seat, mine, and the steps down to the door in the orange-yellow light. The rustling from the back of the bus grew slightly louder. It sounded like someone was moving up the aisle with glacial speed. From the edge of the visual smudge in the back of the bus, a compact figure emerged. It was an old man clad in hope spun pants, shirt, jean jacket, and one of those cheap white painted straw cowboy hats that they sell stacked 30 high at the markets. He was carrying a small cardboard box tied with a rope thick enough to restrain a Spanish stallion. He moved into the yellow patch of light in a shuffle, leather and rope ratchet sandals polishing the gritty floor on the bus. None of the other passengers nor the driver seemed to pay him any attention. No one looked up or stirred as he passed the driver continued his palace guard stare at the south horizon. The old man had his head tilted forward, watching his feet, I suppose, his face hidden in the shadow of his hat. He made his way through the circle of light and paused, contemplating the bus steps. As he stood there, the bus door whooshed open in a bathe of heat, diesel fumes, dust, and the night desert's dank smell of sage. It startled me, and I felt foolish. The old man gripped the railing in front of me with an ancient brown gnarled hand. On his second finger, incongruously, was a large glistening silver ring with an oval polished blue stone held by a ridge of silver cord. He started down the stairs in the unsure way that a toddler does, stretching one foot down to the next level, then bringing the other foot down beside it. He navigated the three steps that way, and then rested at the bottom step. His face was the same level as mine, he turned and looked at me squarely. This was the face of those Mexican museum sculptures, those murals on the flat sides of buildings. It bore 80 years of strength, dignity, power, struggle, weather, care. His eyes were striking. Behind the clouds of age, they were blue and bright as a stone in his ring. I felt embarrassed to stare. His eyes softened, and crinkles appeared in the folds of leather that protected him. He tilted his head to the side just a little, and the corners of his mouth curled ever so slightly. The edges of my vision blurred when he spoke. Enjoy your journey, he said. His voice was soft, resonant with sincerity, and incredibly had no trace of accent. The only response I could muster was a nod. Satisfied with that, he turned his head and made the last long step to the gravel. The door hissed closed behind him, and the orange light went out. Staring out the window, I could just discern his silhouette against the last line of light on the horizon. He walked straight into the desert. I strained to keep him in sight as the bus ground back onto the highway and resumed its noise and rocking. Amazed, puzzled, disturbed, elated, I touched the window. This bus stops mid-desert without any signal. A man old as time gets off, speaks to me in accentless English and walks out in the desert in a dying sunset. Who was that? I asked the driver as loudly as I dared. He looked at me in his overhead mirror and repeated the same English phrase he said when we started this odyssey 15 hours ago. This bus to Cabo San Lucas. <laughs> yeah.